pleasure to be here. It's, uh, I've been many occasions at the EUI, and uh, it's particularly nice to give one of the Max Weber lectures, so thank you for that honor. I'm going to talk about the state in analytical and normative profile, but I've given you a handout, which, which is more like an aspiration, really, than a description of anything I'll probably manage to cover. I think I'll probably just talk about the state in analytical profile, uh, but I thought it might be useful to provide a, an overview of at least the context in which I see these issues arising. So it's a, it's a very remarkable thing that in political philosophy and political theory more broadly, um, there's very little writing on the state. I mean, it's really quite an extraordinary feature of the discipline in which many of us here have been involved that, you know, for example, over the last 30, 40 years, from, say, exam for example, the publication of Rose's Theory of Justice, uh, there's been really very little consideration within the discipline as to what exactly a state is and um, how we should think about the potentials of the state, what the issues are about its organization as well as about what it should do. Just a comment before going, I think probably that's because political philosophy has more and more become focused, um, at least the theory of justice, which has dominated political philosophy, has become more and more focused on what the community of the state should do, the community through the state should do. And that's lifted the emphasis of the question of, well, what should the state be? And it's one thing asking about what policies the state should introduce, but it's quite a different thing to ask about how the state should itself be organized in relation to citizens, and of course in relation equally to other states in the international order. Of course, democratic theory, and Richard is a good example of somebody pushing on that side, has focused on this, but again with a particular focus, which is uh, the issue of democracy. So I'm going to, this is for me, a first run on this material. I'm going to focus on the more general question as to what a state is, and what are the major questions that arise for political philosophy, political theory, about the organization of the state. Okay, so let me just begin with that question, well, what, uh, what is the state? I actually, I understand many of this audience is uh, uh, from legal theory, from law, so uh, it fits quite nicely um, that I should begin with heart, because I think when you ask the question, what is the state, that's so closely tied up with the question of what is law. I mean, after all, I think wherever you have law, you have a state, and wherever you have a state, at least a state in any proper deserving sense of the term, you have law. I find very useful Herbert Hart's approach to the question of what is law, and I want to use that as an entree to the question of what is the state. So you remember that in Hart's uh, book from 1961, I guess, or thereabouts, the concept of law, he begins the question of what is law by asking us to consider a very basic sort of human community. Now written into his considerations is a sense of human nature, our mutual dependencies, our frailties, our concerns, but put all of that in the background. With that in the background, he says, look, in any almost conceivable human community, you're going to get the emergence of patterns. Uh, you're going to get the emergence, for example, of a pattern like uh, truth-telling. Assume that we have natural language as a species by way of background. Uh, assume for a moment that we use natural language, at least in good part, to communicate information to one another. Well, each of us is going to need information from others, and it's pretty clear under some normal assumptions about mutuality, reciprocity, that if I'm going to mislead you, and you discover that I've misled you, you're not going to have much of a motive for telling me the truth in turn. I, of course, am going to realize that, and so I'm going to have a motive in giving you information to give you correct information. Equally, you're going to have a motive 
to give me reliable information, especially if we're in a smaller community, and it was such communities in which presumably early humans emerged about 150,000 years ago, in such communities you're going to almost certainly find a pattern of truth-telling because it's in everyone's interest to, to tell the truth. They can only get others to rely on them if they in turn prove reliable. So you expect a pattern of truth-telling in general to emerge in such a society. And for similar reasons, you'd expect a pattern of non-violence to emerge in the society. There'll be, of course, certainly circumstances where violence breaks out as um, deception is going to break out, but in general you'd expect that as a pattern. And similarly for issues, if there are conventions of ownership or possession, of, um, of not stealing from one another, and so on. Now Hart, in envisaging this possibility, says any such society is going to display what he calls primary rules of behavior. There are patterns of behavior, and there are patterns of behavior which, as you'd expect, people in the community are going to become conscious of they're going to become conscious that this is a pattern around here. We tell the truth. We don't steal from one another. We're not violent uh, without good cause, let's say. Now, if you imagine primary rules like that emerging, a la heart, um, then you've got what he calls a basic community. But any system of primary rules of that kind is going to generate problems. Uh, especially given that it's often going to be burdensome for us individually to conform to these collectively beneficial patterns. I mean, they are collectively beneficial, the patterns he imagines. We're all the better off for most people telling the truth, not stealing, being non-violent, and so on. But it's individually burdensome for us sometimes to refrain from violence or from theft or from deception. And that being the case, there's going to be, there are going to be offenses. So one thing you're going to need in a society of that kind is some way of determining when one individual claims that another individual has broken a primary rule in dealing with him or with her, some way of determining what actually happened because you'd expect that there'll be two sides to the case and perhaps everyone will will argue his own side of the case. So you'd expect some, well, Hart calls it a secondary rule, a secondary pattern of behavior to emerge, whereby people establish a routine for determining guilt, as we call it in our society, in the event of an alleged infringement of one of these rules. Of course, there are going to be other problems too. The rules are often going to be sort of indeterminate. Um, not clear at the edges. So you're also going to want some routine established for clarifying rules when cases emerge where they seem to point in different directions and no one is sure what they require. Again, of course, societies change. I mean, human society has changed rapidly and continually over the period of our of Homo sapiens sapiens. And so, in order to cope with change, you also need some routine for changing the rules in order to govern the changed circumstances. And now, in order to deal with the problems of indeterminacy and change, as well as with the problem of it being unclear who has committed a given offense, again, you need well, what he calls a secondary rule, an additional routine emerges in the society. And now, as you think about this, what you're thinking about is a community in which there are these primary rules, but there are also secondary rules that determine how to change these rules, how to make the rules more precise when needed, and also how to determine if an offense has taken place, and perhaps also to determine how an offender should be treated. The assumption being that an offender should be treated, presumably, in a way that tends to support the rule of these rules, the rule of well, as he would say, the rule of law. Now, I want to suggest that we should have a very sort of simple notion of a state and say that whenever you have a system of secondary as well as primary rules, you have something that deserves to be called a state. You've got an arrangement under which 
it's going to be more or less determinable what the rules are, if they're indeterminate, how they should change, if they're to change, and when offences should be, uh, when it, how it can be determined that an offence has actually taken place, and perhaps how offenders equally should be treated. When you've got that sort of arrangement, I think you're bound to have a state. Of course, in order for that state, that arrangement, shall we call it still, to be effective, it's got to be the case that people generally in the community sort of accept it. Yeah, this is the way we do it around here. Uh, this is a little bit like Hart, for those of you who know Hart, on the internal perspective. People have got to regard this set of rules as our set of rules. And each may have some complaint about them. Each might want them to be slightly different from how they are. But, you know, no one is going to be able to make these rules. Everyone is going to be a rule taker as an individual. And certainly having these rules is going to be better than not having any rules at all, so you're certainly going to get a degree of acceptance. And that means you're going to get a degree of what sometimes is called sociological legitimacy. And that's, that's just going to follow on the purpose of the law and the state in establishing what the primary rules are, how they should change, and when there's been an offense against them. Of course, the second thing that follows is, in order for this arrangement to be really effective, functional. It's got to be the case that the, the, the community in question has a fairly delimited territory associated with it, such that this arrangement constitutes a jurisdiction for that territory. If, for example, people were coming in at random across putative borders, entering it at random, or if people could leave at random, such as having a committed an offence, you just go across the border, then the arrangement wouldn't really be workable. So having this sort of workable arrangement requires also that there's a fairly delimited uh, territory. And finally, because there are going to be other communities like this around, if the arrangement's going to work well, there's almost certainly going to have to be some recognition between communities of that kind of one another. They may make war, of course, but at least in periods of non-violence they accept certain boundaries as existing and accept that the other community or its arrangements rule across that border. It was it Tilly, the historian, who said, the state made war and war made the state. Because of course in this exchange between communities as they negotiate, challenge, go to war over boundaries and then make a settlement, the boundaries become ever more deeply dug until at least the next crisis, you know, the new technology that enables one of these communities perhaps to overwhelm another. What I want to suggest then is what is a state? Well, it's an arrangement which establishes secondary rules for determining change the identity of the primary rules of behavior you're bound to find in any community and determines when offenses have occurred and how offenders should be treated. And does this inevitably in a coercive way. Because of course you can't say, come on now, you've got to have your punishment in order to actually enforce the primary rules. There has to be coercion, an arrangement under which some are entitled to coerce others in to obeying the primary rules and in particular perhaps punish those who have offended against the primary rules. And then this goes naturally with a acceptance by the people who live under it, as the arrangement's really not going to work, it's going to be continual turmoil, and a more or less delimited territory and mutual recognition of some kind, however reluctant, amongst such different communities. So that's what I'm going to take it now is, is something like the state, and I think it fits perfectly well with, uh, for example, um, Weber's famous remark about the state, that the state is the body that claims a monopoly over the legitimate use of force within its boundaries. Because, of course, the arrangement I'm thinking of will only work if indeed uh, it has this sort of uh, sole control over determining the rules when there's been an offense and how to treat an offender. 
there may be a dispersion to the state, we'll talk about that later, but to have a state you have to have something like a monopoly over the accepted, in that sense, legitimate use of a force within the boundaries. Okay, if that's a state, I'm not going to say there are four questions that are really worth considering about the organization of a state. First of all, is a state an agent or not? It's a question that's really not addressed sufficiently. Perhaps it is within law, but in other, many other areas not. Second question, is the state subject to, can it be popularly controlled in some sense? Third question is, what sort of constitution should the state operate under in a broad sense of constitution? And I'm going to focus on, should it be a mixed constitution or a unitary constitution? And the fourth question is one that we're all familiar with, but I think is all too little discussed within political theory, which is whether the constitution in question, as it is almost always, as I will suggest to you, a mixed constitution, but whether such a constitution should be one of, well, let me put it now just in these terms, of a presidential or a parliamentary stamp. But I'm going to draw the distinction in somewhat different terms later. So those are the four questions that I think are really worth considering when we look at the state in analytical profile. I say an analytical profile because in each of these cases I'm going to say there's a question to consider. The state can be organized in this way or that way, and that's all I want to point out in this analytical um, discussion. Of course, those analytical points then raise normative questions. So if it's the case that the state can be an agent but needn't be an agent, there's the normative question, should it be an agent? If it can be subject, in some sense, to popular control, there's a question, should it be subject to popular control? If it can be subject to a mixed constitution rather than a unitary, should it be subject to a mixed constitution? And finally, should it be ordered under a constitution that is essentially presidential or parliamentary? Those are the normative questions. We may come up in Q&A, but I suspect um, that I won't be able to cover them. Sh sh <laughs> short of driving you to total boredom, I won't be able to cover them in the, in the actual presentation itself. So let's move to the agency question. Should the state, is the state an agent, um, or is it something else? Is it like an apparatus of rules? Just by way of background, I think all of us will agree the market is not an agent. Or the market, the mini markets that we live in in any society. I'm going to focus, by the way, from now on, on a single society, putting aside the international order, though obviously it's relevant at various points and may come up in the discussion afterwards, hope it will. But the market's certainly not an agent. Now, why is it not an agent? Well, because, well, let me explain first of all what I mean by an agent. Imagine I often use this simple example, so if you've seen me use it before, read me using it before, forgive the repetition. Imagine that on this desk here, it's cleared of all this electronic apparatus, we have a number of glasses like this, uh, some of them are all empty, some on their sides, some of them standing up. And I put down a little apparatus on the table, like a little, it's hard to know what it is, you know, it's, it's electronic, it's got, well, it's got things that look like eyes on stalks, and the eyes seem to swivel, and it's got wheels that it looks like it could move on them, and it's got sort of limbs at the side. And now imagine that I press a button, and suddenly you see this little apparatus scanning the table, and suddenly focusing on, for example, a glass that's lying on its side. And as soon as it focuses on the glass on its side, it goes, rolls over to the glass and it's into wheels, and then puts out its arms and lifts the glass upright. Well, that's sort of interesting, you think. And then you realize it's now scanning the table again. And there's another glass on its side, it focuses on it, it goes to this glass, and it puts it upright. And you discover as you experiment, that whenever you put a glass on its side, uh, it goes to that glass and it lifts it up. And when all of the glasses are upright, it does nothing. It scans, but you know, it's at rest. 
Now, obviously, you can say immediately, you made a little agent. You know, it's a robotic agent, but it's an agent. And why do we say it's an agent? Well, three conditions. First of all, you can see that it's got a purpose. The purpose is to get gases upright. Of course, you might have some doubts at first about the purpose because it might be that when you've got a glass right out near the edge of the table that's on its side, when it goes to that glass, it often knocks it off the table. So you've got to decide, well, is its purpose either to get glasses upright or to knock them off the table? Or rather, is its purpose to put glasses upright and when the glass is at the very edge of the table, conditions aren't normal, right? And it's an accident that the glass falls off. Probably most of us would think the latter is the better hypothesis. And of course, you could test for it in various ways. And so let's assume we got the purpose, put glasses up, the glass, the glass is upright. Okay, it's also got, of course, representations. The little eyes I talked about as they swivel, we've got to assume, bang, you know, when they focus on a glass on its side, best interpretation is it represents the glass as being on its side. And of course, it's also got the purpose now of putting glasses up, or the desire to put glasses upwards, and the representation of this glass is on its side. Now the third condition, that set of, that purpose and that representation combined produce an action. The action is to get the glass upright according to its representations. So it moves, lifts this thing upright, and then its representation changes to it's now standing upright and the glass uh, and the robot stops. I know it's a silly little example, but it gives you the idea of what an agent is. An agent is a system which has got purposes, which forms representations, representations according to what the evidence is, like if the robot randomly decided the glass was on its side rather than upright, then it would behave in a random way. You wouldn't see any pattern. And it then performs actions to satisfy its purposes according to its representations. Now the market's not like that. Everything that happens on the market, I mean we talk about the market sometimes like an agent, we say the market has decided that the price of oil is too high. Um, but we all know that what that means is that on average the buyers and sellers in that commodity um, that there's suddenly a um, more desire to, um, at a given price, to sell than there is to, uh, to buy. And so the price falls as it's sold by the one and bought up by the other. We all know that's, that's what's really happening and there's no sense in which the market is doing things. But I, the question with the state is, well, the same is true of the state. When we talk about the state changing the law, making the law more specific, enforcing the law, say via the courts, imposing penalties, punishing the offenders, and in general having an apparatus whereby the law is promulgated, made known to people, and is applied where it requires to be applied. When we look at the state in that way, is it or is it not an agent? Well, I think you would see straight away, it certainly might be an agent. It might be an entity of which we can think it's got a purpose. The purpose is to establish the laws, to clarify them, etc., and then to implement the laws, and to indeed uphold the laws by means of identifying when offenses have occurred, and regulating things so that offences are less common rather than more common. Looks like it could be an agent. On the other hand, of course, it might not be an agent. So, for example, consider, well, I think, consider classical Athens. Uh, there's a case to be made for thinking that in classical Athens the state wasn't an agent. So, for example, just to remind you, in classical Athens the ecclesia came together, composed all citizens, but the ecclesia could only make decrees, certainly by the uh, 4th century BC, probably for most of the 5th century BC as well, it could determine whether or not to send ships to Syracuse, you know, as in the famous invasion, it could determine whether or not to raise taxes, stuff like that, but it could not uh, pass laws. In fact, it was a defense under what is called a graphe 
J-O-P-H-E, Palamon, P-A-L-A-M-O-M-O-N. It was an offense under that particular law to try to change the law in the Ecclesia. And if you managed even successfully to change it, you could be brought before the courts and charged with attempting to change the law. And it was a very serious offense indeed. Now when I say brought before the courts, you've got to remember in Athens, there were actually very few laws. Very, very few laws. And if you didn't have to change them, by the way, the way you changed them was this, that someone proposed that there be an investigation as to whether the law needed changing, and if the answer was, well, we should investigate it, then a group of 1,000 people were selected at random from the judicial panel for the year of, um, of 5,000 people, which was itself selected at random from the population as a whole, and those 1,000 people were given one day, they were called the normal fetai, the lawmakers, they were given one day in which to decide whether or not to change the law. And they said yes or no, and that whatever they decided carried the day. That was the way of changing the law. But the juries, there were very few laws, very rarely changed, but the juries consisted of 300 to 500 people might meet on a given occasion. And they themselves were selected by lot, randomly, from the judicial panel of 5,000 that was selected by lot annually from the population as a whole. And they basically decided whether or not a law had been broken, and uh, they imposed the appropriate penalty on the offender. But of course, another citizen had to bring the charge. There wasn't anything like a peace force that, you know, a public prosecutor that brought the charge. And there was no requirement on these courts to be consistent with what other courts or other juries had decided. So it was a pretty random system. You had the law sort of written in tablets, few laws, very rarely changed, and changed under this aleatoric device, device this random device. You had this body, the ecclesia, which issued decrees and organized various things through the boule, the council of 500. And then you had these juries that really were sort of hit and miss in determining whether or not the law was broken with no precedent and no order. Now in that world, I think it's fair to say, there was a system of secondary rules that ensured that the law could be changed if needed, that really was changed, that could make the law more determinate, that had a system for determining whether an offense occurred or not. You brought another citizen before one of the juries, had a system for determining uh, whether the offense had occurred and how the offender should be treated. But these bodies, the ecclesia, was quite independent from the courts, though the courts did as much work as the ecclesia because they determined whether the law was broken when there were very few laws, so they had amazing discretion. And yet it was a different group every day, and which court you went before was pretty random. But still, it was a system of secondary rules. Under that system, we might be inclined to say, well, there wasn't really any agent around. Why so? Well, it was like sort of tossing a die, you know? Every time the issue came up, did you offend against the law? Should you be ostracized or whatever? It was just the luck of the draw. It wasn't as if there was any unitary uh, organization uh, determining in a systematic fashion what the law is, whether it's been broken, how offenders should be treated, making sure that everybody knows what the law is. There wasn't anything as unified as that because the laws were so, so few. So I'm inclined to think that maybe you could represent the uh, Athenian state as something less than an agent, although that's certainly debatable because one issue is, for example, I said that if you tried to change the law on the ecclesia, you could be brought before one of the juries, one of the courts, and charged with trying to change the law. So presumably there was some sense that the decrees you induce the ecclesia to make were consistent or not with the laws as they existed. 
Now maybe if they really were all working to a common purpose, there was a sense of law, was consistent with the law, and they're consistently applying that, you might think, well, it's sort of close to an agent. It's close to having a sort of coherence, like my little robot, a purpose of enacting a body of law and applying it. But I think it's an open question. Now the, the possibility of thinking about the state as an agent, I think probably only appeared in the Middle Ages, and it appeared in more or less the geographical surrounds that we now find ourselves in. Because in that period, in the 1200s and 1300s in particular, the idea arose of an universitas, as it was called in Latin, as it was later called in bog Latin, as you might say, a corporatio, a corporation, a corporate entity. In fact, the Pope, arguably, in 1246, had a lot to do with introducing the idea that a, a body of people could itself be an agent, or a persona, which was the preferred word at the time, when he said, in issuing an edict on the following question, can a corporate body, an universitas, be excommunicated? as some of his predecessors had thought. And in a, a, a document he issued, addressed to the University of Paris, to the, the masters and scholars of the University of Paris, he issued this document that actually had a lot to say about the status of precisely a body like the University of Paris. It might have been like the European University Institute. And what he said was that such a body Although it is a person, that was a great phrase, although it is a person, cannot be excommunicated because it doesn't have a soul. What he said was, it's a persona ficta. Now those of you who know Latin will know that ficta in Latin can mean either a made-up agent, in the sense of a pretend agent, or it can mean an artificial agent, in the sense of an agent that's just made by human hands. Fictional agent or artificial agent. The philosophers all went for fictional agent. So Aquinas, 20 years later, is arguing that no, no, no corporate body is really an agent or a persona, it's just a, a pretense. But the lawyers, I'm speaking to the lawyers in the audience now, I'm told most of you are lawyers. The lawyers really went for this idea. They said, great, there are artificial persons as well as natural persons. They don't have souls, and so the Pope was right about that, Innocent IV, who was himself, by the way, a lawyer. He's right that they don't have souls, but they really are persons, are agents. Why so? Well, because they've got purposes that they pursue, and they can pursue these purposes according to representations that they form in a very consistent way. They can perform like an individual agent. And of course they looked around and they said, look, there are guilds, you know, which own property, which can bring people to court, which can be brought to court, which can, be, which can make contracts with other bodies, which outlives their members, which remain the same guild even though the members have changed. Some have died, others were born and entered. Those are now persons, artificial persons. And this notion got extended and extended to, in the mid-1300s, Bartolus of Sasso Ferrato is using the idea of a corporation to argue that a city republic like Perugia, where he lived, he was trained as a lawyer in Bologna, he was a professor in Perugia. Perugia had a problem, which was as a city republic, and it appeared that the emperor, being Dominus Mundi, the lord of the world under Roman law at the time, could, if he wished, invade a city like, um, like Perugia on one of his more or less frequent trips down into Italy from, from Germany, and basically change the law and redistribute property and so on. He couldn't do that in a city which had a signore, which had a dominus, a princeps, a prince because there was another item of law as they took it to be, although no one has yet to find it in the digest of Roman law, they took it to be a law that the king in his own kingdom, Rex and Suo Regno, 
Es Imperator Sui Regni. He is the emperor of his own kingdom, meaning that the king, if there was a signore or a princeps or a rex within the Roman Empire, then he represented the emperor in that region. And so the emperor could not invade and change things because he'd be fighting against himself, his representative within the city. But the city republics couldn't help themselves to that argument. And then what Bartolus showed was that they could, because he said, look, think about a city republic. It's just like a guild. It's got a concilium, a council. And the people, they, 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 they represented, that's the crucial word, on that council, secundum cupulum et secundum vices, according to rotation and according to representation. And he said, that's just like a guild or a monastic order or whatever. And that means it's actually an agent. It's a corporate agent. It's an universitas. But he said, if it's, a, if it's a, a, an agent or a persona, it can be a princeps. And then in a very famous phrase, still being quoted 200 years later, he said, in the city of Republic like that, the populace was a sibi princeps, a prince unto itself. So the idea was that the people were a corporate person and the people rule themselves. Anyhow, the question we're asking is whether the state could be an agent. Well, it might not be an agent, it might be like Athens as I painted it, or it might be more like Perugia, where the people, at least according to part of this, are like a princeps and they rule themselves. They are populist leader, he says, a free people. He describes this, it's a democratic regime as he sees it, but he describes it as a, a regimen ad populum, a, a, a popular uh, regime. Now, the idea that the state was an agent became more and more popular. In fact, the people who really introduced the idea that the state had to be an agent and Bartolus used this argument for a specific purpose, to persuade the emperor that he wasn't entitled under Roman law to invade Perugia or any city republic because each city republic in Italy, like each state or city that had a king or a princeps, actually did have a king or a princeps. It's just the people, the corporate people, were that king or princeps. But it becomes really a much more robust possibility, the idea that the state could be an agent with Jean Baudin and Thomas Hobbes in the 1500s and the 1600s. And they, 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 they basically introduce, as, uh, as many of you know, they introduce the idea of the, of the sovereign state. Here's, here's their way of thinking as I see it. Up to then, even at the time of Bartolus, there was this idea that the Roman law, which had been rediscovered in 1095, would have become the Lex the Ius Communis, as well, the Lex Communis as it was known, the common law, not in the English sense, the common law in the sense of common to church and to state, because everybody thought this was the paradigm of law, and all aspired to conform to the law. And so you might have thought that up to then, you could look on a state, like even Perugia, as really receiving a lot of its law from outside, from tradition, from the Roman law, where the scholars, like Bartolus, could tell even the emperor what the law was. So the law wasn't the emperor's of the emperor's making, and it wasn't of any particular state's making. So you might have thought this, that since the, the state, now the arrangement, it just took the law from elsewhere. It took its primary and secondary rules, that's to say, from elsewhere, from the digest of Roman law, as interpreted by the various interpreters. And there were a lot of them. Law was a really big business in the 1200s and 1300s and 1400s. So you might have thought that, well, really what is happening is you have an arrangement under which that's what the law is, and maybe you've got arrangements for determining if there's been an offense and for punishing offenders, but like there isn't really a single state that's producing the law because it doesn't produce the law. There's just an arrangement whereby different people apply the laws taken from outside. But then Baudin has a huge impact. Baudin is one of the humanists who make a profession of studying the classical texts, 
reinterpreting them and often finding, of course, that the texts are not nearly as integrated as they looked. And he's one of the legal humanists in the early 1500s who looks at the corpus of Roman law and says, it's a mess. It's from all over the emperor, out from all over the period of the Republic and the Empire. It involves contradictions internally when you look at it closely. And hand in hand with rejecting the idea of Roman law, he says, every state has got to make its own law. And then he says, what is a law anyhow? And then he says, a law is a command. It's a command by the, well, let's use the word state. That wasn't his word. He did use res publica. It's a command by the res publica, by the state, to its members. But then he said, if law is a command, or it might be a command from the king, if it's a monarchy, and that's what he was really thinking of, is France has a, is a monarchy at the time. But if it's a command, he says that there's got to be a commander. And the commander in a monarchy is just the king. And in a democracy, as he thinks about it, the commander is the people as a whole. And he thinks they've got to get together and vote on the law in order to act as a corporate body. But the, where the commander in a democracy, where the king is a commander, the commander in a monarchy, and he makes the famous point, of course, you can't give a command to yourself. So the commander in any state, be it a, an assembly of the citizens or a monarch, has got to be above the law. Because the law, after all, is a command by that person. Can't command himself, ergo, he's above the commands of the law. And equally, if he or she or it or they are at the source of the law and the, the one ultimately in charge, there can't be anybody else who's got power over them, unless they're not really in charge, they're not really the commander who is necessary in order for there to be a system of commands that constitute a law. And by this means, he and Bob and Hobbes follows him very much on this, comes to think of the state, you have to, you have to think of it as an agent, an agent that makes the law as a command, that is itself above the law, that imposes the law on those who are subject to the law. The citizens are the subjects of the, of the king. And at that point, it becomes more and more difficult to think about the state as something that might not be an agent. But still, it's an open question in the organization, so to speak, of, of a state. Now, there, there's much else to say about that that I've sort of put in this handout, but we don't have time to cover it, and I'm not going to address it now. I mean, it has, um, it, it, maybe it'll come up in discussion. So let me move on to the next question about who controls the state, and is there a choice there? Well, the interesting thing, if you go back now to Bartolus, is that for him, the word he used for the state was kivitas. But those of you with the neo for Latin, we realize that kivitas relates to the word kivis, a citizen, in the way membership in English relates to the word member. So the kivitas, while he used it for the state, it also means just the citizenry. His image, and the image of Bodan and Hobbes as well, was that a group of people that acted as an agent, be it in a uh, guild or in a state, they could act as an agent only insofar as they had a voice through which they spoke. That voice represented them. And that voice said, basically, what should happen. And insofar as they took it to represent them, insofar as they took it to be their spokesperson, to that extent, they, the Kiwis, the citizens, really were in charge. Now, if, in order to have a state, you've got to have a voice that speaks for all the people, it sounds like you can't avoid having popular control. And that really is Bartholus's picture. Short of having a single king who just rules without authorization, really, who might as well be a despot or a tyrant, short of that possibility, if the people really are involved in ruling themselves through a certain voice, then it's they themselves as individuals, as a kivitas, as the citizenry or membership of the city that rule. So the state just is the membership. The state just is the citizenry. The word kivitas covers both. Like we say about a club, 
the membership has decided, you know, that fees shall be raised in the club. The membership there refers to the club as a corporate entity, but it also refers to just all the members considered together, because they're really just the same thing looked at from two sides. Now, you might think that on the view of the medievals and of Bourdain and Hobbes, that a people became a state through having a single voice through which they spoke that represented them, you might think you had to have popular control. But both Bodan and Hobbes argued that while a state had to begin with that sort of popular control, certainly Hobbes argues this for most of his life, perhaps not in Leviathan, but the earlier works he clearly does. A state begins with people coming together explicitly and implicitly to authorize someone to speak for them. And he says they may authorize themselves as a body to speak for them, in which case you've got a democracy, as he calls it. They may decide that the majority vote in their number will decide what happens. But equally, he thinks they may decide to establish a monarch, for example, to invest one person with power over them. Doesn't that mean that they still are in control if they invest this person with power? Well, he says no, because they can pass over power irrevocably to that person. In fact, he thinks that if they didn't pass it over irrevocably, there really would still be a democracy and he would be like their delegate, you know, he would be like someone that they control. Uh, but he thinks that that's not the only possibility, of course that is a possibility too, but what can happen is that they can irrevocably give power over to a, um, over to a magistrate. So this means that while government proper, this is a from the rule of a despot, requires everybody to be involved to the extent of authorizing the regime in place. Everyone agrees implicitly or explicitly, of course, on the service, implicitly in some sense, to go along. But that's required and looks democratic. He wants to say this body can still authorize someone to become powerful irrevocably so that the power can't be taken away. And now you get one of the great 17th, 16th and 17th century political debates because you get those who are called Monarchomax, meaning king killers, represented the Huguenots in France, for example, and the Catholics in Scotland, who argue that they, the people, have authorized the king, if there is a king ruling over them, and that means they can recall power from the king and take over. They use the word vindicatio, which is actually the word in Roman law, for when you've lent someone a possession and you want to claim it back, in Roman law it was called a vindicatio. So a very famous text of 1576 is the vindicatio contra tyrannos. The vindicatio, the claim by people, these were say Huguenots in France, that they could claim back the power from the king of France because he was oppressing them, right? And Bodan and Hobbes and later Kant, very much with them, argue that once power has been invested in a prince, a monarch, it can't be recalled. And they've got a nice argument for that. Hobbes has a nice argument, which Kant is still retailing 150 years later. What Hobbes argues is as follows. He says, look, the people become a single body, an agent, insofar as they get a voice that represents them, a voice through which they speak. Prior to that, they're just a mob, a throng, he says, a heap. He uses all these derogatory terms. And they're basically in what he calls a state of nature. You know, it's just every man and woman for themselves. Except when they agree amongst themselves to have a voice that will speak for them all. And if they have agreed amongst themselves that this voice shall be the voice of a king, for example, as in England or France at the time, then the idea that they might kill the king, as in the Malcolmac word, or get rid of the king, withdraw power from him, is absurd. And here's the argument. As soon as they kill the king, the voice that speaks for them, they cease to be a single body, because they don't have any voice anymore. They become a mob. 
in a word you might put it for them, regicide, killing the king is suicide. It's killing yourself as a corporate people. And you find Kant using that argument in the 1790s, when, for example, he says that if you have a, if you have a, a monarch, even one pretty despotic and tyrannical, he says even tyrannical, he may even have been thinking of Frederick Wilhelm, Wilhelm in Prussia of the 1790s, he represents the people, and the people have no right, nor have I an individual, a right to try to deprive him of the power, because he says, if he's wiped out, we become a mob, and that's the worst thing of all. We return to the state of nature, straight from Hobbes. Of course, it gives him a very strange perspective, because he says about the French Revolution, he says they should not have done it, they should not have killed the king, because they did exactly what he's saying, would be amount to suicide. They cease to be a unitary people, spoken for. However, he says, as I thought of it, actually things are a little bit better now that they have done that. Uh, so, on the one hand, he wants to say, it was really a pretty good thing that it happened, but he ought not to have happened, or they ought not to have done it. This is one of the wonderful paradoxes that Kantians get themselves into, but that's a topic for another day. <laughs> However, it's very interesting to see this. Okay, so the issue we've been discussing is control. So on the one hand, it looked like the people must have to be in control, given the tradition of the voice. But Hobbes and Bourdain says, no, because you can authorize irrevocably. And then ironically, you get the result that having authorized in that way, you can't actually recall the power, you know? So it's one thing, or the, if you've never given away the power, that's fine. Of course, Rousseau comes on the scene, and Rousseau, who's also very much in this tradition of Bodan and Hobbes, but Rousseau says, look, only a race of madmen, that's his exact phrasing, would agree to irrevocably authorize someone other than themselves to speak for them. So he says the only possible sort of morally acceptable arrangement is that the people should remain a democracy, as Bodan and Hobbes would have called it, which is to say a committee of the whole which decide for themselves on everything, especially the law. And of course, that's exactly what Rousseau proposes in the social contract, that the state should just be the assembly of the citoyens, of the citizens, uh, not looking at issues about decrees, too particular for Rousseau, he's good on that, but at least looking at laws, and then giving the laws to be to be implemented to magistrates, separate magistrates. Anyway, that's the issue of control. There's another issue which I'd love to talk about, but I'd better at least very sketchily cover the other two topics, particularly I'd like to talk about because it concerns the lawyers, which is the issue of constitutional paradoxes that are still debated in the law books, or at least in the legal theory books of the kind that I, that I, I look at. I, I think that that's, uh, that's a false issue. Maybe it'll come up in the discussion, I hope so. Now, the other two issues, very quickly, I'm going to be if I can take 10 minutes, yep. uh, that is keep me within the hour anyhow. So the other two issues, what I call the constitution issue and the legislature issue. Well, the constitution issue, of course, whenever you've got a state, certainly there's going to be an agent. But even if it's not an agent, you have to have a constitution. That's to say an accepted set of rules about how the secondary rules themselves are established, right? And um, that's what a constitution is, a way of organizing things. Okay, that's particularly true if the state is an agent. There's got to be a constitution that tells us exactly who, how people are going to be appointed, what the limits of their uh, power is, what their tenure on office is, what challenges, if any, can be brought to them, and so on. But there are two sorts of constitution. One is, you might say, a unitary constitution. A unitary constitution is the sort that Rousseau wanted, and is the sort that Bourdain and Hobbes wanted too. It's a constitution that sets up one supreme unitary sovereign. For Bourdain and Hobbes, that sovereign could be a monarch in whom power was invested irrevocably, data for Kant, or it could be a committee of the whole, a committee of all citizens. Of course, for them, the citizenry would not have included women and might not have included all men either. But from, same goes for Rousseau, but let's assume it can, uh, it can um, include everybody. 
So you have a committee of the whole or a single person. Each of those is a single sovereign in the sense of being a single agent. On the one hand, an individual agent, on the other, a corporate agent. This uh, committee of the whole that meets every now and then and acts as an assembly according to majority vote. They opposed the tradition of the mixed constitution, which Bodan and Hobbes saw as belonging to the republican tradition, deriving from classical Rome, associated with Machiavelli in this city, particularly associated with the English Revolution in the 1640s, and later associated, of course, with the French, and in particular with the American uh, Revolution. The mixed constitution they saw as trouble, trouble, trouble. My own view about Bourdain and Hobbes is that they wanted to say, okay, democracy in principle might be okay, but come on, who can take it seriously? The idea of all the citizens coming together and voting as a committee may be okay in Genève, but in England, in Britain, for God's sake, the whole of Britain, or in France, clearly was a no-go. And I think Buddha and the Hobbes once said, okay, it will work in principle, but of course, you know. And they wanted monarchy, whereby you get just a single unitary um, agent, an individual agent. Rousseau, on the other hand, thinking of, of Geneva, although he's very sympathetic with the Republican tradition in as it, he endorses the idea of freedom as non-domination associated with that tradition, unlike Buddha and Hobbes. And Hobbes. And he still is persuaded by them that you can't have the mixed constitution. He accepts from them the idea that a mixed constitution would be, would be chaos. Because as Hobbes will put it, how can, if you've got three different bodies, how can you get one voice? And after all representation and statehood comes through having a single voice, how could you get that if you've got chattering voices that are always in competition with one another. Rousseau accepts that and actually makes fun of the mixed constitution, developing a, a version of republicanism in which you've got a unitary, a unitary state where the traditional republicans had a mixed constitution. Now, mixed constitution, what does it involve? Well, it involves, people have to say, separation of powers. But that notion actually only goes back to Montesquieu. Um, but still, it does involve the separation of powers. You get at least a loose separation of powers. You get legislative power, you get executive power, you get judicial power. And of course, there may be many other powers in a state as well. After all, a, a central bank is a star, a power, even if it's at arm's length and still vaguely under the control of parliament, is still a separate power. So is an electoral commission that dictates the boundaries of districts. Uh, so are they an, audit, an auditor's body. So is the Bureau of Statistics. So you get separation of these powers in any mixed constitution, but you also get, crucially, sharing of power. You get sharing of power, of course, between two houses of, of parliament or congress, if you've got a bicameral system of legislation. And you've got sharing of executive power between the government and these various independent agencies you may have, like the um, like the, um, uh, the Central Bank, for example, um, or agencies like the um, uh, various commissions that may be established, various bodies that may, like the Electoral Commission, may be established to do certain jobs. You get a sharing of power with them by the executive. And that system of sharing may itself be, of course, coordinate, where you get two bodies like two houses of parliament, or it may be hierarchical, where you get a higher body that can veto what happens later, like the president can veto a law passed to him by the Houses of Congress in the United States, or it might be a, a propose and dispose sort of system, you know, like James Harrington imagined in the 1650s, whereby the Senate, a group of elite would propose laws and then the people would accept them or reject them. Rome was like that actually because only a member of the Senate could actually propose a law but it took a popular body like the um, um, concilium, like the, um, tri the, 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 the tribal assembly or the centurion's assembly to vote on the law. So sharing the power can take many different, uh, many different forms. 
Of course, in our society, also, sharing of power will extend to including or giving a certain independence to media, auditing, reporting, review bodies, as I said here, tribunal, and of course, the courts in a mixed constitutional independent. That's crucial. That actually already makes for a mixed constitution. So I would say most of our countries are involved in a mixed constitution. Now, Hobbes and Boda and even Rousseau say that's impossible. You can't have a mixed constitution. Their argument, I think, is just not very good. Their argument is that many bodies can't make for a single voice. They assume that you can only get a single voice when you've got a single spokesperson, a voice that will dictate what the law is, for example. When you've got a single spokesperson, individual or corporate. But of course, you can have different voices that contribute to the making of law, provided that there's some coordinating device that ensures the ultimate voice is actually going to be consistent over time and with other things that the voice stands by. So there's absolutely no reason, people have been saying this since the German theorist Bessel in the 17th century, there is absolutely no reason why you can't have different bodies coordinated with one another in such a way that a single voice emerges. It may involve, you know, different bodies, but here's a picture of the mixed constitution. In the mixed constitution, there are two modes of control. One is an authorial mode. You know, if Richard and I are writing a paper together, one possibility might be, I write a draft, he looks at it, he rubs out certain things, he suggests I should make a change here or there, I take it back, I make the changes, I pass it to him again, and he makes further changes, the suggestion comes back to me, eventually we publish the paper. Might be an unusual mode of co-authorship, right? Basically, I've been the author and he's been the editor. But of course, both of us share in determining the final product. Both of us share in controlling the final product. I as author, he as editor. Now, in a mixed constitution, what you have is authorship and editorship mixed up. You know, as in, for example, America, um, either house can propose a law, but the other house has to agree to it, it can edit it, it can send it back, and then it sends it back again, and the president can finally veto it, or ask for those changes which he gets, and so on. So it's an authorial, editorial interaction. That's the characteristic of a mixed constitution. And you get that between courts and legislature, as the court strikes down something, and the legislature returns to the business, trying to amend to get by the courts in various ways, it's that authorial editorial. So I want to say that, of course, it's possible to have a mixed constitution. In fact, most democratic states today are mixed constitutions, contra the Bodine Hobbes. But it was an issue we had to put by us, you know? Like the issue of agency or popular control are now the mixed constitution. These are questions which were very vital questions in past ages. They're still with us. They still deserve normative treatment. But now they're, they're sort of um, easier to come to terms with. And the final question, which I think is one we face very sharply, at least those on the other side of the Atlantic in America face, which is there are two modes, I call it the legislature question, there are two modes of mixed constitution. In one mixed constitution, like a normal parliamentary one, I'd say a parliamentary one where there isn't a very high degree of proportional representation. What you get is the following. You get a group that captures a majority in the parliament for the term of the parliament. And that literally is in cahoots or captures the administration. And this emerges, of course, because it's the members of the legislature, whoever elected, who themselves elect who is going to be in government, in the executive. And because they maintain the executive, they've got to make common cause with the executive. And that means that this well, party, as we know, in power, or maybe a coalition of parties, it means that it is a sort of single author that really does most of the authorship in the system. And then the other bodies in the system represent editors in relation to that author like the opposition parties represent a sort of editor, whether successful they are, the courts represent an editor if they can strike down a law, and not the house, as there may be one independent, represents an editor. And those of us who write in the newspapers are campaigning in the streets. 
you know, uh, form social movements and the non-governmental organizations that home in on, 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 on proposed legislation or actual legislation and reveal its problems and the media that makes this possible. This is a massive editorial sort of apparatus that surrounds this primary author. This is a mixed constitution, but it's a mixed constitution of a specific kind with a presumptive author and many different editors. Consider, by contrast, the American system. In the American system, there is no single author. In our parliamentary type system, the party in power, for example, what it's got is a fixed majority. And with a fixed majority, it can plan legislation for the whole term, and of course it can advertise it, it can ask to be elected on the basis of that plan. In the American system, nobody can promise anything, because what happens once the representatives are elected and the president is elected, is that it becomes a set of deal making. As now I'm in the House, I propose something, I've got to get members of the House to support me, maybe by a party organization, maybe by crossing, crossing the aisle, and then I've got to get people in the Senate to support me, and then if the, the, both houses support me, I've got to get the President on side. And finally, of course, it's got to be okay with the Supreme Court if there's a challenge to the law. And as I can do that from the House of Representatives, so a senator can do that from the Senate. And any senator and any member of the House of Representatives can do that. And similarly, the president can invite members of his party and prompt them. So you can see there are many different authors. No one has a monopoly on authorship. Constant, as a result, it's, it's, it's a more sort of dissipated system. It's a system that's harder to predict. And it's a system on which people can very often renege, like the Republicans threaten all the time to do about raising the, the, the debt ceiling, for example. So that's, those are two variations on the, on the mixed constitution. One with the primary author, the parliamentary system, and one with no primary author, presumptive author, the presidential system, represented roughly by uh, America in particular. And that's a big issue, I think, as to how we should organize our government. So that's the fourth of my issue, is looking at the organization of the state. We've seen what is the state, then we've seen that it might not be an agent, as in the Athenian example, or it might be an agent. We've seen that if it is an agent, it's via, so to speak, a voice that is authorized by the citizenship. But that that's persisted with either, at least according to Hobbes and Bodan and Kant, either with um, a, uh, a monarchy or a single agent autocracy or with uh, something involving popular control. And there are wonderful arguments uh, in the history of thought that are of enormous interest. And then we've seen on the Constitution question, uh, we've seen that the Constitution could be unitary. But equally, it can be mixed because there's no reason in principle why different agencies might not collaborate under a discipline of coordination so as to produce a voice, ultimately a set of laws, that is pretty well consistent, or if found to be inconsistent, can be changed appropriately. And finally, we're seeing that another issue that arises with the mixed constitution, and most of us have mixed constitutions nowadays, is between the presidential system, which has no presumptive author. Anyone can be an editor, anyone can be an author within the system versus the parliamentary system where you can have an author. I think those issues are really should be more at the center of our discussions in political philosophy as we need to understand our history and the issues were, that were there then, as well as revivifying the issues as they arise for us today. Of course, they all lead into the normative questions I've mentioned, but I don't have time to look at those today, so thank you very much.